Hi, I'm Michael Forster, and I'm here with Solomon. Solomon Hikes. Solomon Hikes, who's going to talk to us today about his company, Dagger IO. Yes. Yeah. That's yeah. Right. Dagger IO. Yeah. All right, Solomon, tell us all about it. Sure. Yeah. Dagger takes your CI pipelines, usually a mix of shell scripts and YAML that are painful to use and develop. It turns it into clean codes that are a joy to develop and actually run on your local machine and in CI. Excellent. So we're really like solving the problem of having like disparate isolated systems for these CI, CD systems. You were doing this at the code level instead of at a higher abstraction layer, is that correct? Yeah, every software team has pipelines to build, test, deploy, just to ship the thing. And they're all a mess of duct tape. But they're just a bunch of tools glued together with shell scripts and YAML. And we replace the duct tape with Lego. Yeah, so it's proper code. You can write it in either Go, Python, TypeScript. We have SDKs for all these different languages. And you just take your DevOps knowledge and you encapsulate it in these nice clean functions that you can test and connect with each other. And so we turn that mess of shell scripts into proper software. Interesting. So then what is the method of execution there? Is there like a common engine that you invoke to, or like how does that like actually get executed depending right. on the pipeline? Right. So underneath there's an execution engine that we developed that's based on containers. Uh -huh. So we're the Docker founding team. So we reused a lot of what we learned making Docker and then we improved it some more. And so we, under the hood, we, with everything you execute, resolves to containers that are run in parallel and interconnected in a graph. So you have data flowing between these containers. So you have a really nice scalable execution engine. And because it's containers, it's reproducible. So you run it on your machine, I run it on my machine, or it runs in CI, the same thing's gonna happen. Yeah. Excellent, okay. So if someone was a brand new beginner and they wanted to get their hands on your technology, test it, learn more about it, what would be the best way for them to do that? Ah, so it depends if they're looking for bleeding edge experimental latest features or a reliable, stable deployment. If you're looking for a reliable, stable deployment, you should go to dagger.io, our website, follow the getting started guide, look at the list of features, follow the quick start, it's easy. Join our Discord server. There's a really active community of CICD, DevOps experts who love to help each other. If you're into experimental bleeding edge stuff, we have this pre-release feature called Daggerverse. It's at daggerverse.dev. Okay. And it's a list of modules, just reusable modules that encapsulate every possible DevOps thing you might want to do, build, test, deploy. And it lets you call them in a really easy way right from the command line. So if this is going to come in, in the next release of Dagger, and it's the missing piece of the puzzle. It's true cross-language reusable components. And that's the key to building the software ecosystem that rolls up all of DevOps. So almost like a registry of like common problems that you run into yep. or things you want to do inside of DevOps pipelines. And therefore you could just pull from these modules and execute them in your code. Exactly. And there's a lot, there's a lot of those. Picture the GitHub Actions Marketplace or the Circle CI Marketplace, GitLab CI Marketplace. It included anything you could ever do with containers locally or in CI. Any build tool, any deployment tool, any container signing, container scanning, configuration management, infrastructure management, spinning up an ephemeral database for your integration test. There's just half of the people who came to the booth today were people from other booths. We're going to write a module to integrate their thing into the Dagger platform. Yeah, so that's the, da the Daggerverse. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Can't wait to see how that's going to grow yeah. over time. When is that? Oh, so the next release is coming soon? Yeah, coming soon. Okay, yeah. excellent. So then, would there be anything else that you would want a beginner to know or to think about Dagger if they were getting started? Anything else? Yeah, I think if you're getting into DevOps and you feel like it's very complicated and you're not smart enough, you're smart enough. It's just that it's messy and complicated and we just got to make it better. It's going to get better. Excellent. In your experience, like since you're running now, is this, how many companies is this for you, for Dagger? Is this your third, fourth? Oh, well. This is my second company. Okay. Docker was 10 years of my life, 2008 to 2018. And this is my second company. Yeah. And I started it with a Sam and Andrea, who were also the founding team of Docker. So we brought the band back together. Oh, interesting. Yeah. That's very interesting. There's an argument to be made speculatively 
that none of this that's happening right here would not have happened if you and your team had not given the standards for containerization out to the world. That there would real be no easy way to consume Kubernetes at scale, and that everything else that is, supports containerization wouldn't have an ecosystem to wrap itself around. So I have to ask, what prompted you and your team to give it out to the world? Did you know at the time that it was gonna be necessary for adoption? We felt very strongly that containers were revolutionary technology that had untapped potential. We worked very hard to realize that, and it took us five years of work to get to Docker. And it, I think it was just the right, we were at the right place at the right time. A lot of smart people had a gut feeling that containers were important, but they couldn't quite place it. And then we just crystallized it. And turns out when we launched Docker, a lot of smart people were building something like it and they saw Docker, they're like, that's it. And they just joined the project and then we started all building it together and then it became a standard. And it turns out standards, the right standard at the right time can unblock a lot of innovation. And soon after that, there were a gazillion container-based projects and one of them was Kubernetes and that one got a lot of investment. Google, Red Hat, then a whole ecosystem around infrastructure and the data center ecosystem cult converged around that. And I remember when Kubernetes launched at DockerCon, at our conference, yeah. Yes, and that's an interesting thing too, because I remember when DockerCon and Docker came out, yeah. we are keeping an eye on it. Then all of a sudden Kubernetes is on the scene. We'd heard some rumblings about it already and where Google was gonna come out with that. Were you as surprised, as, as at least as I was, that Kubernetes like two or three years later was so dominant in terms of orchestration for containers? I, it's so hard to guess which project is gonna take off. I was, no one would have bet on Docker taking off. At least Kubernetes had the largest internet company behind it, so that's not nothing. So it was not a terrible bet to bet on that one, but there were a lot of orchestration projects, so it wasn't obvious either. Yeah, I think it just, it solved the need and it was very complimentary of Docker. Yeah, it seems so obvious on hindsight that when you look back, you're like, oh yeah, that was a natural fit. It was almost like Docker was, made for Kubernetes, but actually there was no association there up until the time that they went for their first GA release. Kubernetes was built to run on top of Docker, yeah. But the original Borg project wasn't, right? They modified it as a, in an outflow, or do I, am I getting that wrong? No, you're not getting it wrong because that's the story, but the reality is Kubernetes is a from scratch implementation by a separate team in Seattle that were very active in the Docker ecosystem, and they tapped into the internal container expertise at Google that is very real. And they built this new project inspired by Borg on top of Docker. And then later when it became larger, a lot of the core Borg team with a lot of operational experience came on board and joined and helped make it more scalable, more robust. Because we tend to forget that in the beginning, Kubernetes was a toy. Right. It was a proof of concept. And later it became robust and scalable with the help of this ecosystem here. Yeah, and with the help of the Borg team at Google. Yeah. yeah, and if they were already Docker inspired, it would be hard for them not to be influenced by the concepts they had already been yeah, exposed it to. Was, it was like a hybrid of the Docker influence and the Borg influence mixed together, basically. And thus we have this amazing yeah, yeah. ecosystem that we have today. Yeah, yeah. And conferences out <laughs> yeah. in large in North America. That's great. Yep. Good. In terms of the kind of business side, because I remember learning Docker Swarm and thinking to myself, oh, this is going to be like the next thing because this is going to be orchestrating. And then Docker Swarm went a different direction like Mirantis and Mirantis ended up with it. Are there any decisions there or any kind of insights that you would have done differently or maybe would have, I don't know, take a second look at considering like where everything landed? The situation we were in with Docker with this container craze, it's similar to the situation OpenAI is now with this LLM craze. They're in the middle of a freaking tornado that they started right. and the whole world now wants to be part of it and everyone's asking for stuff in every direction. And so they have a limited time window to just deliver on everything that they're being asked. And so internally, I'm sure they're just going through this list of 50 things that are urgent. Urgent requests for all these features and products. So we were in the middle of a tornado and our, we had our own list of many features and gaps in the platform that we were asked for. An orchestration of containers across a cluster was one of many things. It wasn't particularly crucial. It was important, but there was also composing, a composition of containers of, for a, a multi-container applications, what is now Docker Compose. Uh, storage, how do you plug in storage for containers? We had a whole ecosystem of storage vendors asking, how do you do that? Logging, 
networking, security, and load balancers, all of that. You just went through the list. Okay, yeah. do we do this in-house? What's the ecosystem looking like? Should we let a thousand flowers bloom? Or should we pick a winner? Or should we do it in-house? Okay, what's out there? 50 orchestration products. Everyone was doing an orchestration project. And Kubernetes was one of them. Is there a clear winner in the ecosystem? No, it took a long time at that time. Right. But we needed it now. Do we pick a winner? Eh, too early. Can we just let it continue? No, we need, the feature needs to exist. We need to give a solution to people. Should we do it in-house? Engineering decision, yeah, let's do it in-house. There you go, Docker Swarm. That's it, it was just an engineering decision to solve a problem. And fast forward a year, now Kubernetes is taking off, it's got an ecosystem. So then, but by then we have our thing. What's interesting is the way you say it, it makes it sound like you were not only managing the tornado of your company having created this landmark, very provocative, progressive, but also innovative tool that was gonna change the way we did things, but you're managing a movement as well, in a sense, and figuring out, I have a vision for what this tool is gonna do, and you're looking at the landscape saying, okay, who's gonna solve this problem? Can we do it? Should we do absolutely. it? Absolutely. That sounds like a much bigger task than just running a company. Right, no, it was huge. It absolutely was a movement, and it's a movement that just appeared, and we just happened to be there in the middle of it when it appeared, and we were appointed, okay, you're the stewards of this movement right now. We were honestly just doing our best to keep up with this insane scale of the container movement that appeared out of nowhere. It was an amazing time. But now I have all this gray hair. Because it was also- Don't we all? Yeah, it was just very stressful to try and, because you don't want to let that movement down. I would say looking around, you have it. And considering to be like one of the engineers who has literally ridden the wave of what looks to be at least the next decade or two or three's worth of technology innovation. And we'll see where AI we'll see. pushes things, right? But at least for the next 10 years, that has been the foundational technology that we've been following since 2014, 2015. So I thank you for giving that to the world. Oh, well, yeah, because you. that was an incredible gift, as you can see in this case. Is there anything else that you want to share or tell anybody as far as like that experience? Yeah, I think you mentioned AI. I think it's really interesting because I think the AI wave is turning into an AI application wave. And at the end of the day, it's still going to be software. And I think at the end of the day, it's still a software engineer's world. I think this is the biggest opportunity for software engineers and the DevOps world that helps them ship since the container movement. And I don't think it's at odds with it at all. Yeah. I think everyone who's here building better ways to ship and scale applications is going to benefit enormously from a whole new wave of applications. It's not going to be a separate universe over here. It's just the next thousand workloads to deploy and scale, but they're coming and they're AI workloads. Are you already looking at how to incorporate certain AI facets into your product that you have with Dagger? We didn't have to go, our community brought it to us. I would say maybe 25% of our use cases involve some sort of AI component. Because what happens is if you're experimenting, you can do it in a vacuum, but once you need to productize, you still gonna have to ship through the same pipeline. Right. Your app still has a database and a front end and a back end and, infra and storage, all of that stuff. And so really the challenge is to productize your AI app, how do you incorporate these new AI components into your existing pipeline? And honestly, I think the answer is with Dagger. Yeah, obviously, so, yeah. And considering that you have an incredible history for solving problems and making them more simple, more palatable, more consumable for both DevOps engineers and for the developers, <laughs> I think the history is going to show that that's going to be true. So well, I, I can't I, wait uh, to see what Dagger does next. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.